Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. I want to talk about capital punishment today. This year, the country saw the lowest number of executions and death sentences in decades. This decline didn't just happen. Rather, it's taken years of organizing and hard work, much of it by the remarkable people at Equal Justice USA and their grassroots partners in states across the country. Shari Silverstein is its executive director, and she's my guest today. Welcome. Thank you. Hello. It, it, it is amazing at how the question of ending the death penalty has changed the way it's posed since I was younger. You know, we used to talk about just the morality or something like that, the ideology. But now it's a very practical thing. That's right. Well, so yeah. Explain it to me. Well, I think that, um, you know... I, I think what's happened is that people have come to see that there's really sort of two different death penalties. There's the theoretical death penalty, and then there's the death penalty in real life. And so when you're just talking about the question of theoretically, is it okay to have a death penalty? Is it reasonable to um, execute someone who's done something terrible? You know, on, on that sort of theoretical question, people, are, you know, for the most part are okay with that. Um, but in real life, the way that we've seen the death penalty play out has been an utter disaster and a complete failure. You have the execution of innocent people. You have e enormous costs, wasted dollars going to, you know, chase an execution for 20 years that never happens. Uh, the majority of death sentences are overturned at some point and then get resentenced to something else. So we're going through this enormous amount of effort for nothing. For nothing. It's, so, it's become so bizarre, especially now with this injection and all the compounds that they, ha they get and that, that they can't get and the doctors saying this and the pharmacies saying this and right. the struggle for a state to even look for the stuff so they can inject somebody that they've had on death row for 20 years. I mean, it is, it's bizarre, right? It's become like a circus. I yeah. mean, states are now passing these laws, these secrecy laws where um, so that it becomes like a state secret where they've gotten the drugs from um, or a state secret who's, you know, carrying out the execution. And so then, like, you can't get any information about it. And then, um, the ex you know, the executions are shrouded in secrecy. And then something goes terribly wrong. You have an execution that lasts for two hours instead of the five minutes that it's supposed to or someone gasping for breath when, the th in theory, it's supposed to be painless. And, you know, yeah. I mean, it's just, it's yeah. been sort of crazy. And so it started when? I mean, the Supreme Court... In the 70s? Yes. Yeah, so abolished we abolished the death penalty. Yeah, in 1972. That's yeah. right. And so the Supreme Court sort of found that the death penalty, the way that it was carried out, was incredibly unfair and very arbitrary. They said it was as arbitrary as being struck by lightning. Um, who did or didn't get the death penalty. And there were all of these ways that sort of drove that unfairness. Um, you know, a lot of racial disparities, things like um, the death penalty being mandatory as opposed to sort of having any kind of discretion or being able to look at the case. And, um, and so they, they named all these problems um, and said, for these reasons, the death penalty is, um, you know, cruel and unusual. Uh, so what they meant by that was not that the death penalty theoretically was cruel, but that it was unusual in that it was so randomly carried out um, and that that randomness caused it to be biased and unfair. In the, those days, though, we didn't have the DNA and the, and, and the, the so often uh, discovery that they had the wrong person. Did we? That no. Well, DNA, right? DNA didn't sort of come um, on board until much later. And that's that was the the really thing that did it. That was definitely something that brought to light a lot of the problems. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the the truth is, you know, so there have been 156 people who've been sentenced to death and later exonerated. A small portion of those are DNA cases. The truth is that in most murders, there isn't any DNA to yeah, test. Yeah. Um, and so you're dealing with things like coerced confessions mm. and eyewitness identification, which is really unreliable. People think, you know, that eyewitnesses can remember what they've seen. They can't. Yeah. And frequently also, and I think we're discovering that more and more, there are also people who are eyewitnesses and testifying in return for their own benefit. Yes. So, uh, we, we call those jailhouse snitches or jail, what do we call jailhouse them? snitches or jailhouse, jailhouse informants, snitches. right? There are people who, um, you know, maybe they've, be, maybe they've been in like a holding cell with the person who's on trial and they'll sort of say, oh, I heard this person tell me, I overheard this person tell my cellmate that he committed this murder or something like that. So when in the 70s, when the court said this is our cruel and arbitrary, mm -hmm. um, they still allowed the states to have their own sets of standards. No, at that point, it was that meant that the 72 ruling overturned the death penalty in every state. Every, and, and including so were, the, fed, including federal the feds, right. And so then there were four years with no death penalty. 
um, where it was unconstitutional. But the states, um, it, it wasn't sort of a, a, a popular movement that had ended it, right? And so the states yeah. were kind of clamoring to bring yeah. back the death penalty. And so they started rewriting their laws to comply with some of the things that su the Supreme Court had found were wrong. And those cases eventually made it back to the Supreme Court in 1976. And the court said, OK, with this structure, that's OK. But every state didn't have the same structure, did it? Well, there are certain things that are common to all oh, the right. state death penalties now. So for example, um, in any death penalty case, you have um, what's called guided discretion. So there's no mandatory death penalty in any case. There have to be certain aggravators or certain specific things that make a case death eligible. And then a prosecutor decides whether or not to pursue the death penalty. Um, and so you can have a case that is death eligible, but doesn't get the, you know, the prosecutor doesn't seek it. Um, and then once you get into the, the, the trial, you actually have two different trials. There's a first trial that determines if the person's guilty or innocent uh, or not guilty. And then there's a whole second trial where the jury is supposed to weigh what they call aggravators and mitigators. So aggravators are things that make the crime worse and mitigators are things that kind of mitigate against. And yeah. so if the aggravators outweigh the mitigators, the jury can select death. If the mitigators outweigh the aggravators, then the person would get the next sentence. And the there. judge can overrule that, though? Um, in certain states, certain not states. in most states, yeah. And is it the, is, are the two trials in every state? Yes. No, they have to be? Yes. That has, that's one of the conditions of the court? Yeah, and that's one of the reasons why the death penalty is so incredibly expensive. People think that it's because of the appeals process. Um, the appeals process is like the tip of the iceberg. Actually, a lot of the expenses are borne right up front because you have these two huge, very complicated trials, a very complicated jury selection process. You know, you can't serve on a jury in a death penalty case if you don't believe in the death penalty. Um, and so that's called death qualification. If you say you don't. If you, right. <laughs> I mean, you have to be willing to impose the death penalty. Um, and so for peeps, you know, people who have sort of moral convictions or, you know, other convictions that would get them to, to say, you know, I just, I don't believe in the death penalty. I'm not going to give it to somebody. They, they can't be on that jury. Um, and so that's a very complicated jury selection process. You have all these pretrial motions. You have more attorneys. You have more investigations. You have more experts. You have, you know, all of these extra things. And then the whole second trial where you have to look into the defendant's entire life history to see if there are mitigators or, yeah, exactly. And also, though, there's a disparity in the quality of the defense. Yes. Yes. There's a, there's a famous <laughs> saying that you're, you're better off rich. Was it you're better off uh, rich and guilty than poor and innocent? Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, right. That's right. And we have, it, does that come? That, that is a, a factor, isn't it, in commuting a death sentence? Uh, and it, it's, a, it's a bigger factor in receiving the death penalty. Um, so, you know, a lot of, uh, there are definitely people who've been sentenced to death who had lawyers who were drunk, who had lawyers who slept through the trial, who had, you know, there's a very famous case in Texas was many years ago where the court actually, the appeals court actually ruled that the Constitution guarantees you the right to a lawyer. It doesn't say the lawyer has to be awake. No, that's good. That's it great doesn't one, have right? to be awake. It doesn't have to be awake. Yeah. <laughs> and there is a con basic contradiction in the whole thing because somebody is, is sentenced to death. Uh, they have to have the right to appeal. Yes. So that takes time. Yes. I mean, once you've got the sentence, those appeals do take time, right? Absolutely. Right. And then after, so you've been on death row for 20 years, 15 years, even 10 years. You've been on death row. And then they come and you get executed. That is just, isn't that part of the cruel and unusual? Uh, it, yeah, I mean, it's definitely one of the things that's really broken about the system. Um, and, you know, there's sort of a catch-22 in that. Like, you can't, if you make the death penalty fast and cheap and easy and not complicated, then you're guaranteed to increase, you know, get more innocent people executed and more unfairness and more biases in the system. And all the things that we've put in place to try to protect against those problems, they just slow the system down and they yeah. make it more complicated and more expensive. Yeah. And they still don't solve the problem. I mean, yeah. if you look at the people who, you know, in, the, in 2015, this year, there have been six people who were exonerated after evidence of their innocence came to light from death row. Combined, they spent over 100 years in prison in, on death row. And so if any one of them had gone through a quicker process, that truth would never mm -hmm. have come out. Right. Is it is the guy's name the man's name Grossip? Is that Glossip in Glossip. Oklahoma? And he's still 
under a reprieve, right? He yes. So he's still on death row, and um, he was up for execution in in Oklahoma, and there was a problem with the lethal injection drugs, and so they suspended the execution. And he took that to the court, didn't he? Wasn't that a case of the Supreme Court? It was, and the Supreme Court actually ruled that the execution could go forward. Yeah. Um, so the the Sup Supreme Court case was about a specific drug. Um, that they were using, and is it okay to use that drug? The Supreme Court ruled, yes, it is. Mm -hmm. um, what's really interesting about that case is that um, one of the justices, Justice Breyer, wrote a dissent in that case where rather than sort of talking about the lethal injection specifically, he, he basically indicted the entire death penalty system, and he sort of invited Cases. the case. He said it's time for this court to look at the death penalty overall, and he wrote, it was a very long, well-researched, um, basically like a roadmap mm -hmm. for, you know, how the court should look at this. So are they going to look at it this year? Uh, you know, we don't know, we don't know the there timing. Cases there? There, there are always going to be cases, the question of whether the, they the court takes one or, what, or what, doesn't. What interested me about this particular man was he, that he wrote about being on death row. I mean, he's been on it now for a very long time, right? Mm -hmm. And I, what I remember from reading about it is that he, he said that, you know, he had friends that all of a sudden... It was time after 10, 15 years, mm -hmm. and they're executed, and then you wait for the next one to go. It, it's, it, I, it reminded me, I was once in front of the Huntsville, Texas death row place, mm -hmm. you know, and actually I even went inside to go to wow. the ladies' room, which was really wow. quite an experience because <laughs> it's got a bridge. It's a moat around it or something. Okay. But what, was, what struck me is they were watching a football game, and we were outside, and you could hear the roar when there was, you know, a touchdown or something. Mm -hmm. And in a way, it was normal life, but they're all standing there waiting to be executed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It just, it, it was just incredible. Yeah, there's actually, I, I don't remember the details of it, but there was a story um, from Texas Death Row about um, one of the, I think it was one of the guys on Death Row had written a story about how when he first got sent, his first day on Death Row, and he was so scared going to this place with all of these supposedly terrible people. And he just sort of wrote about how people like welcomed him in and somebody brought him like a toothbrush and someone else came around with a book and, you know, just ha like yeah, the sort of normal the, the yeah. way that they, yeah, yeah. yeah. There, there should be a retrial. I mean, if we're going to stick with this, which of course I think we shouldn't, but there should be a retrial just before the execution. I'm I, reading about the woman who was executed down south. Mm -hmm. How long was she there for? She, I don't know how long she was there. You're talking about the one who um, convert, became, became an evangelical Christian. Yes, right. Yeah, in Georgia. I mean, here her, she had been there for a long time. Mm -hmm. Here she had totally changed, mm -hmm. but there was nobody to hear that. Right. And still they proceeded with this execution. Well, technically the parole board is supposed to hear that and yeah. they're supposed to be able to say, you know, I mean, they're supposed to be able to consider anything and they can recommend that the execution be commuted, you know, to the life without parole or a life sentence or something else. Um, but, you know, the problem is that the, the parole boards are, um, you know, they're really conservative. Like they're, they're they yeah. don't, I don't mean just politically conservative because in fact, you know, one of the things we haven't yeah. talked about yet is there is a growing conservative movement right. against the death penalty yeah. now. Yes. Um, but they're they're very narrow in what mm -hmm. they consider, and you know they tend to not they tend to err on the side of caution and not on the side because of because they're always afraid that there'll be somebody will come out and they'll be held responsible, right? Are they the same parole boards that that are there for people who are just serving sentences? I believe they're yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah. Now when they you know they can commute the sentence to life in prison without the possibility of parole, so the person would never necessarily get out. But they're still I think there's just a I think there's a sense you know the, the parole boards were set up to 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 allow a moment of mercy in the system. But I don't think the they parole do. boards, for no, the I most part, think of their job as being yeah, about mercy. I agree with you. you know? um, but I think life without parole is also not a great thing. <laughs> I don't want to say that, but it's a, political it. <laughs> way. <laughs> it's a political way of getting around being opposed to the death penalty. Mm -hmm. I mean, life without parole, to keep some people in prison forever, um, when the purpose of prison is rehabilitation, is another contradiction in our system, mm -hmm. and I think unjust. You know, yeah, we'll get to that really, later. Yeah, people have really mixed feelings about it. I mean, one of the one of the um, groups that we work with a lot are family members of murder victims. Yes, um, and who who pose Let's the talk about this. Yeah, yeah, and you know, the family members that we work with are very divided on life without parole. Some are very, very much in favor of it, and they they believe that you know the thing that they need most is for this case to go away. Right? Someone gets life without parole, they're never going to hear about it again. They're not going to have to go back right. to the parole board year after year after year for right. twenty. 
20 years. And then others, the same reasons they oppose the death penalty, they also oppose life without parole for some of the reasons yeah. that you said. So, right. you know. The personal cost that, mm -hmm. it, that it is to the families of victims, mm -hmm. um, to the juries that sentence somebody to death, right? It, it's also very emotional, isn't it? It is, yeah. We, we sort of call that secondary trauma. And yeah. it's the corrections officers who also carry out the executions. Yeah. There are a lot Terrible. of stories about corrections officers, you know, the executioners mm -hmm. who have nervous breakdowns, mm -hmm. they become suicidal. There's one, um, one man that we work with a lot who um, carried, he oversaw eight executions. And he talks about how the men that he executed come and sit on his bed at the, in the middle of the night and haunt him in uh -uh. his dreams. Uh -uh. You know, I mean, he yeah. just like, he can't, uh -huh. he can't let them go. Yeah. Um, you know, and these are people who are like, they're just doing their job. They're not, they didn't, didn't make this decision. They didn't decide to execute them. They, they often become friends with these folks. They, you know, get to know them over a 20 year period. Let's talk about Equal Justice USA. Great. It's an amazing organization and it, it seems to be organized in a, in a quite an unusual way. Is it? Uh, yes, I think yeah. so. Tell me what you're referring well, to. Well, I'm t referring to people in different parts of the country right. that are your experts. Mm -hmm. You're really like, are you really like a, I don't mean to, the, a consulting, an organizing, consulting, I don't that's tell us a, what Yeah, you do. that's a piece of what we do. So yeah. we, yeah, so we work in different states and we are essentially like a kind of a, a full-time, full-service consulting firm that's totally free. Right, so the, the local organizers, whatever it is that they need to get their campaigns from where they are to the win, we're gonna like fill those gaps and we're gonna come in. So we help them with strategic planning and training and outreach and organizing and message development and um, legislative strategy and um, uh, you know, everything under the sun, board development, fundraising, whatever, that they, whatever they need to help them sort of become professionalized is, and stronger. And to help them then overturn the death, death penalty, penalty in their state. That's right, right? that's right. Yeah. Um, but the other thing that's kind of side by side with that sort of consulting work, as you called it, um, is that we have this sort of national organizing piece. Um, and that's, a, I think, the other thing that makes us really unusual is that we have um, both right and left on our staff. Um, so we do a lot mm. of across the aisle organizing and working with conservatives and um, uh, conservative evangelicals and political conservatives. And we have people on our staff who do that work and who um, you know, we, we don't necessarily all agree on everything, but we come together on so this So political issue. conservatives are people who say it's a waste of money? They basically. have a variety of, yeah. a variety yeah. of reasons. And so, evangelicals? Yeah, I mean, the, so the conservative, um, the, our conservative uh, outreach person, he talks about what he calls a conservative litmus test. So he says he feels a policy is conservative if it's fiscally responsible, small government, and pro-life. And the death penalty and is none of the above. Yeah. Um, so that's in the sort of political uh -huh. conservative. Then on the evangelical side, you know, there's a lot of um, focus on redemption and that, you know, everyone's made in the image of God, um, mm -hmm. you know, and I I'm not a personally an evangelical, but mm -hmm. we have, you know, my colleague who is evangelical and um, she just personally came to feel that um, she was called to do this work and it didn't make sense to her that the evangelical community was considered pro-death penalty. Yeah. She said, this doesn't align with my faith. Yeah. And so she set out to go and talk to evangelicals and she talked to, you know, leading evangelicals all around the country and she started to find, okay, she's not alone. A lot of people agree with her. Um, and, you know, this October, the National Association of Evangelicals mm -hmm. just, um, they reversed their 40-year oh, pro-death penalty position. amazing. Yeah. So you work in the States. We, mm -hmm. You were in Maryland? Yes. New Jersey, mm -hmm. New York. Yeah. You're in Nebraska now. We're in Nebraska now. Mm -hmm. Is that going to be overturned, the governor's? Uh, well, we, you know, we hope, we certainly we hope, hope not. not. Um, so uh, in Nebraska, we had um, a really incredible success in May when the legislature mm -hmm. voted, the conservative right. legislature voted to repeal the death yeah. penalty. And not only a majority, but they actually overrode the governor's mm -hmm. veto. So it was a super majority. Um, and then the governor and his, um, you know, his associates sort of raised you know, put in a bunch of money and, and brought it onto the ballot. And so November 2016 is when the, oh, the vote It's going to be. be interesting to watch. What, 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 what your, the premise of your th is, I think, is that when people really understand what it's all about, they're going to be opposed. That's right. And there have been all studies, haven't there, that the decline in the death penalty is parallel to the decline in public opinion in favor of That's right. So you're coming in from the bottom. That's right and you're convincing people. Do you think politicians just misread the general tenor? 
Um, I think that they misread, uh, yes, I think that they misread um, how much people care about this issue. I mm -hmm. mean, the truth is that, you know, opposition to the death penalty has gone up. Um, but even more than that, you know, when some, like polls have sort of done, you know, if, if, if you disagreed with your uh, representative on the death penalty, but you liked them on everything else, would you be more or less likely to vote for them? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, if your representative voted for to end the death penalty um, and you didn't agree with that, would you be more or less likely to vote for them? And, you know, the bottom line is that people don't vote on this issue. Yeah. It's not a driving, it's interesting. It's not a driving yeah. issue for, yeah. for people. So we saw that with Mary Cuomo. That's right. You know, who, uh, but, and uh, we saw the whole thing. I mean, it, it was religion. Mm -hmm. it, it's taking a life. It's very interesting, though, that kind of thing. And yeah. A very important. That, so this part, that's part of your, I mean, you've got almost three parts. <laughs> you're helping people who've been sentenced to death. You're tra teaching people or organizing people. And then you're helping victims, mm -hmm. families, families. So tell me about that. Sure. Um, so, you know, one of the things, like I said, we do a lot of work with families of murder victims. And over the course of working with them on the death penalty, we came to learn a lot about trauma and victim services and what crime survivors really need in the aftermath of tragedy and how much they're not getting. And so, you know, so many of the things that the crime victims need um, the victims' families or survivors of other crimes have nothing to do with what we do to the person who harmed them. They need things like, you know, financial support, grief counseling, trauma intervention, somebody to change the lock on the doors or to clean the blood off the walls or days off from work or, um, you know, all kinds of things. And they, they, those resources are so unavailable. There are so many unmet needs, and that's especially true uh, in communities of color, where you have people are more likely to be victimized and less likely to get any help to address their trauma. Um, and so when you look at the death penalty specifically, you see, okay, here's the system where not only are the victim's families not getting anything that they need, then you look at, okay, who's committing these murders? Who's ending up on death row? It's a lot of people who have um, these histories of unaddressed trauma throughout their childhood, severe abuse, sexual abuse, abandonment, um, all kinds of childhood trauma. And, you know, which is not to say that all traumatized people go on and kill someone or that they don't have to be held accountable for what they've done. Um, but it, it's so you look at, like, what are we doing in response to these things? And so we just ignore those problems until the person turns their trauma outwards and then we execute them. And now somebody's dead and then we execute someone else. What if we just address that trauma in the beginning mm -hmm. when it happened? Mm -hmm. It just seems like it's such a waste that we're not doing that. So how do you do this? Well, I mean, you know, so we're, so we're doing a few things right now. One is that we're um, really trying to work on expanding victim services in communities of color where they don't have access, but they have, like mm -hmm. I said, the, these incredible needs. And so we're working with um, what we call non-traditional victim service providers um, who work it with crime mm -hmm. survivors in communities of color, but don't often get access to, say, like federal victim services funding mm -hmm. to help them to become stronger and get access to funding and be able to increase their their yeah. reach. Um, we're also doing we have uh, we've just launched a program called the Trauma Advocacy Initiative, which is basically rooted in the idea that um, just like our justice system right now, you know, marshals all of these resources to punishing people part of the response to violence should be about healing trauma. That in fact, the focus of our justice system should be about healing. And so helping cities and communities to invest in trauma care mm -hmm. as part of their public safety strategy. So we're you know, looking at doing some trauma training with police departments, um, yeah, yeah, things like that. Yeah. Um, of the, the families that you work with, yep. uh, do they, um, do they oppose, well, like, they're not the people really to say that they're gonna work Yes, they're the, the victims. Mm -hmm. Do they, how many of them oppose the death penalty? You know, I don't know that there's been a poll of victims' families that's been done mm -hmm. to answer that question in terms of, um, you know, numbers. What I can tell you is that in the states where, where we've worked that have ended the death penalty, there have been um, a much greater number of victims' family members who come out opposing the death penalty than who come out and testify in favor of it. So you usually have you know, one or two or three victims' family members who strongly support the death penalty, who make it their business to come out and talk about it and get on the media. And it's and really then, a catharsis for them? I mean, is it? You know, in some cases... Is it cases, a healing thing for them? I can't... 
this is this is what ha this is for what I have seen happen is that this horrible horrible thing happens. It's the worst thing you can imagine, right? I've never lost mm -hmm. anybody to mm -hmm. murder in my family. I can't even imagine mm -hmm. it. And this justice system comes and says to you, the worst thing should like the worst thing should happen. And if it, mm -hmm. if if justice is served, this execution is the exa is the example of justice. And so if you know people people want like the highest thing that's available because. Mm -hmm. They're so devastated. And that's the only thing they get offered, right? All they get offered is this long sentence or a death penalty. And if you give someone the choice, do you want more or do you want less? People want more. And they're told this is going to make you feel better. Yeah. And then 20 years they get stuck in the cycle of waiting with their lives on hold for this thing to happen. In most cases, never actually happens. A handful of times it does happen, but by then they've, they've put their lives on hold for 20 years, yeah, yeah. Um, getting stuck in this court process yeah, yeah. and... You know, but once you're sort of invested in that, um, there have been a number of people that we've worked with that they got into that cycle and then after eight or nine or ten years, they said, oh my God, if I had known in the beginning what I know now, I would never have wanted right. a death penalty. Right. So it is a long, horrible process. It's a long, process. horrible process. You know, so in Connecticut, for example, which ended the death penalty in 2012, there were almost 200 family members of murder victims who came out and said, we don't want this. This is not helping us. This is a failed policy. Uh, we need victim services. We need, you know, we need other things, not this. So we've come to the end of this program. Oh, that was fast. But it's a, it must be um, so encouraging and supportive for you to see this progress. It isn't it's every really day that you can get into su such a serious, horrible question and really begin to see the, the turning around. That's right. That's right. Yeah. I mean, I've been doing this for 15 years, and I think, you know, I think that this is going to end. Yeah. It's incredible. Ten years. I didn't even ask you how you came to get into this, <laughs> but I will another time. Okay, great. And really, we wish you all the luck and success, and we'll, I'm certainly going to wait. Can't wait for Nebraska. I want to see what happens. Yes, we do. <laughs> yeah, we're working hard. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you. If there are any people you'd like to hear or topics you'd like us to explore, please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you.